Now, there are in general, you get uh, three kinds of responses to the kind of things that we're talking about when we start talking about obeying and teaching the things that Jesus taught. And uh, I've had a lot of joy and delight in teaching this to people, especially get them cornered in a place like this, <laughs> and uh, get the intensity. Um, and actually, I think you can learn a lot about how to teach people that do the things that Jesus said just by reflecting on your experience here in terms of the intensity. Remember what I said about you can't get a shower by one drop every five minutes for three, for three years. Most of what we do in the way of church services is like that, frankly. And so a part of our strategy, if we're going to uh, teach people, is to arrange different occasions. I don't recommend that you throw out what we do in the way of regular church services, though I do have some recommendations that I will talk about after brunch, uh, about changing them somewhat. But in general, you don't start by changing things like that. Yeah, if you do, you'll just have a wonderful brawl <laughs> Even trying to change the way the seating is arranged in an auditorium is like the Civil War all over again. Um, now, what I have found is that people struggle on these first two, three paths of Christian progress. One is to try harder to live up to the commandments. Don't do it. And that's what makes people hopeless. Uh, obviously, there should be a desire to keep the commandments, but you don't get there by trying harder. I mentioned earlier that the secret is not trying, but training. And that's what I've been trying to do and lay a foundation for uh, in what we have spent our time on. Number two is live in defeat. It's remarkable how much there is that recommends this today. I want to call it to your attention and not mention any names. But once you understand this, you will recognize it as you read popular magazines and books and things of that sort. That the, the response to the problem is call it brokenness and rest on forgiveness by grace. Well, you better do that anyway. Uh, but brokenness has become exalted in recent years as a constant condition in which you must live. Don't sing that song to me about victory in Jesus. There ain't no victory in Jesus. You just stay broken until you're dead and out of here and something will automatically happen and you'll become a person who is comfortable in righteousness probably because you're, you're, you are rid of that despicable sack you call your body. So there's tons of misunderstandings here, some of which I've touched on more or less, but just think a moment about the first two. Try harder or give up. And I, as I say, I don't want to mention names. You, some of them are very popular. They're very good people and they're very good writers. But you can identify them. Say, so where does it come out? And actually a good place, I will say, a good place to f f watch for this is in the magazine Christianity Today. And I mention that because it's a very balanced magazine. It's a very good magazine. But watch what shows up. And you're going to identify one way you let the steam off is 
live in brokenness. And that will go with the gospel that is predominant in those circles, which is forgiveness. Yes, ma'am. If you try to help people differentiate oh, excuse me. brokenness and humility, how would you go about defining difference? I would say that humility empowers you and brokenness doesn't. Remember what humility is now, and here again, I go back to the books. What? Living independence. Absolutely right. <laughs> Give that girl an A in the course. <laughs> That's right. Now you see, brokenness is a limited form of dependence. It's dependence on forgiveness. Yes. Well, that, now, you need to go through that. The question is if you're going to live there, right? And now, the way that would show up as you go on would precisely be learning more and more of dependence upon God. But as you learn more and more of dependence upon God, you are going to find that you don't have to try harder and that you wind up doing what Jesus said. See, the, the, the second point here goes with living in Romans 7. You understand what I'm saying? It goes with living in Romans 7. You just don't go on to chapter 8. You just say, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Nobody is going to deliver me. I'm so broken. Paul didn't do that. He moved right on. Now, having been broken was a great benefit to him. But he, that, that wasn't his whole life. Now, in one, uh, in one retreat setting, a wonderful fellow named Don Ingebretson. I don't know if you know him. He's a part of the leadership uh, of one of the denominations uh, in Chicago. A wonderful man. After struggling with this for all, most of his life, trying harder for the most part, because actually if you do believe, number two, your conscience will not leave you alone. And you wind up trying harder. <laughs> and so in the process of the experience and the teaching, the third option here is progress toward the character and power of Christ by indirection. That's the way disciplines work, is indirection. And that's true in any area you don't just start with Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata and try real hard to play it. If you succeeded, it wouldn't be because you have become a musician. Maybe you have become a robot. Progress toward the character and power of Christ by indirection, discipleship and active grace with disciplines in the process of spiritual formation towards Christ-likeness. Now, I would like to just pause a moment and ask you to look at that <coughs> and see if you feel you understand it because this is the whole deal as far as the human side of holiness is concerned. This was Don's exclamation when he came in 
about the middle of the second week of the retreat. This is too good not to be true. It's too good not to be true. And the fact of it is that this is the scriptural teaching in the New Testament. This is the record of the people of Christ down through the ages. Uh, there's a lot of deviation and missing and it doesn't make you perfect and you can't reduce it to a mechanism. That's one reason why I purposely avoid trying to package this stuff too tightly is because it isn't meant to be like that. It is meant to be a personal walk with the Lord. It is meant to be a personal walk with the Lord. And, uh, and, and when we are helping people with it, we want to remember that. That we can instruct them, we can set examples, we can answer questions, we can do all of that. But what it comes down to is what is happening with them and the Lord. Yes. So the indirection is a lot. I'm just not here. So yeah, yeah, well, uh, that's what goes on in your walk with the Lord. The indirection is through discipline. Okay. Now, and remember that thing I said to you over and over now. Don't try to do what he said. Try to become the kind of person who would do what he said. That's the indirection. Okay. That's the indirection. So running scales, that's the indirection. Because if you do that, it turns out you can actually do that other stuff that Beethoven wrote out for you. And it will be something of a surprise and a gift when you do. And that will always be true of, how, of our growth in the Lord, yes. I just want to make sure you're using the word indirection here in the sense to describe what we've been talking about this week, about not trying directly, but trying to be a person. That Absolutely true? right. Indirection means you do one thing by doing another. Right. And that's why try harder fails. It tries to do the other without doing the one thing. And if you don't get the full scheme, then you turn the discipline into what it's all about. And that's what you see this all over the place. You go to things supposed to deal with spiritual formation, you find out spiritual formation is about disciplines. Give us a cotton-picking break. The whole thing is about obedience. And you can, now you can test uh, programs and speakers about spiritual formation by discerning whether or not it comes out at obedience. And it will so often, it will stop at disciplines. Yes, sir. Um, you might have already touched on this, and if so, I apologize, but with regard to the human side of holiness, how would you define the conscience? The what? The conscience. Well, the conscience is uh, not a reliable sort of thing. Uh, if you have learn to walk in holiness, your conscience will be completely reliable. But if you haven't, you need to watch it and you need to keep it at least running parallel with the scripture. If you do that, it's a very good thing. But actually, I would prefer to also keep it in touch with the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now we haven't, you know, I wrote a whole book on hearing God. We haven't talked about that. But you want to become familiar with what it is like to be spoken to by the Holy Spirit. And then you have conscience also, and then you have the scripture. And if you're lucky, you have a good companion or two and you listen to those. And you will probably stay uh, on the right direction. Yes? I'm trying to put the pieces together about what, what you spoke about, about oaths. And, and it seems to me that, that we have a history, a church history, of dealing with problems by going to the opposite end of the spectrum. So, like right now, we feel like people don't even recognize sin. 
so we have to go to this end of the spectrum of teaching them that they have to be broken. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just curious if, if I'm on the right track there, and, and if that's kind of a way of being manipulative. It depends on how you do it. If you do it by speaking truth and allowing the spirit to work with you, uh, that's the way you ought to do it. But it seems like we can use truth in a very manipulative way. We can, and absolutely. Trying to jerk people back in line here. Well, in general, you want stop trying to get people to do things. Right. That's. But that's what it It's the natural tendency to make one's own kingdom prevail. And you embed that in an institution. And then you, it has a kingdom, and you want to make it prevail. It's a deadly natural tendency. We're never far from it because... Well, restate your point. Well, the point is, it seems like in the context of, of the church and how they respond to problems, mm-hmm. that we will go to the other end of the spectrum in teaching, say, about brokenness, when we're trying to deal with people who don't even recognize sin. So we go all the way over here and preach, preach, preach on brokenness. Is, is, that, is that doing the manipulation thing with both? If it, if it doesn't say something more than that, it probably is, right? Because w- one way of making people dependent on us is to convince them they can do nothing. And that happens often in religion and uh, happens in many different ways. We don't want to make people dependent on us. We want to make them dependent upon God. Now, if they are dependent upon God, they are not going to just be broken. And uh, that might threaten our, our kingdom. I finally got it, I think. <laughs> yes. Help me how to move from getting people to do something. I'm sorry? To, to getting them to lead a life of discipleship? Yeah, yeah, I, I, when you say, don't try to stop, you, you said, stop getting people to do something. Right. But yet, I see that by indirection, we're involved in discipleship and active grace mm-hmm. and discipline. That seems to be Okay. Good. When you do things that seem wise, you don't trust your own efforts. You trust God. You let him get them to do something. So that's the teaching that we need to make sure we have. We do need to teach, we need, but uh, very often we need to listen. We need to find ways of being with them. We need to find uh, out what exactly is messing them up. And so there are lots of things that we can do, but we never trust our efforts. Or our program. Or our program. I, I prepare endlessly for things but I never trust my preparation. So when I walk into the room to teach, I'm not trusting my preparation. And sometimes that's apparent. (laughs) (laughs) Now then, uh, I I do want to say just a few more words about Calvin. Uh, because Calvin was so right about so many things. And I want to just touch on the points that he goes through. Um, Page 18, holiness. See, Calvin thought that holiness was the whole thing. And he was right. And uh, now what does holiness mean? We've spent some time talking about that. What does it look like? And on page 18, 
Holiness means full obedience to Christ. Now, that's right. And then you have to be careful. And one of the things that not only Calvinism, but Arminianism and all the isms, is they come to this, and then they have problems interpreting it. And the almost inevitable tendency is to try to interpret it in terms of specific actions that you do. So I just want to say to you, when you read, when you read this by Calvin, do understand holiness does not consist in a specific set of actions or beliefs that would mark you out as a good Calvinist or something of that sort. And now, he, he has it right, the top of page 19, the paragraph opening there. We should exhibit the character of Christ in our lives. For what can be more effective than this one stirring consideration? Again, you have to hold that out of the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisees. You do not exhibit the character of Christ by exhibiting behavior that fits some of the things he said. And see, over and over when in church history, when people get serious about this, they will pick up on one or two things that he said, and that will turn out to be the character of Christ. And it only takes a glance from someone who hasn't been taken in to realize these folks don't have the character of Christ. They're mean. You know there are mean Christians? You ever run into one? <laughs> And they, they're nearly always because they have bypassed the character of Christ. And they've latched onto a little something and said, oh, that's, that's it. No, it, you have to go deeper now. Now then, in order to handle that, he, um, on page 25, introduces the idea of self-denial. Self-denial, you can always... Uh, use your song, we cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus. That is resigning your kingdom. That is self-denial. Self-denial does not say, oh, I am nothing, I am nothing, I am nothing. You ain't nothing. You're something. And you bring that into subjection to Christ, the King, and that is self-denial. It's subjecting your kingdom to his kingdom. It is surrender of the will in precisely that sense. And it means anything but that you become a nothing. This is where you get to really have substance. It's just not your substance. It's God's substance. So when we talk about the character, we want to see that this is primarily a matter of self-denial. And on the bottom of 27, seeking God's glory means self-denial. See, it is not a negative concept, self-denial. It's not a negative concept. It's an affirmation of God. And uh, now, how does that express itself? Well, uh, Calvin has some struggles with that, uh, but um, there are some beautiful words in, in what he says. Uh, bottom of 29, self-denial means sobriety, righteousness, and godliness. And this is a wonderful passage in Titus chapter 2 that he's referring to. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us. Now, continue that sentence. Teaching us what? Now, that's, that's the test of any gospel. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we might go to heaven when we die. Is that what it says? 
that he might redeem unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. That's what you're made for, Ephesians 2. That's what grace does for you. It puts you out there zealous for good works. So, so you keep that on the positive side. And uh, I, there's one line here that is so unlike Calvin as he's presented on page 36 by Roman num by uh, Arabic 4. The law of love does not only pertain to the sizable prophets, but from the ancient days God has commended us to remember it, and this I love, in the small kindnesses of life. The harsh picture that comes out of Calvinism and Puritanism is not an adequate representation of Calvin himself. And uh, as he goes on, he talks about how to be of good cheer, uh, page 38, uh, in the middle of Arabic 3 there, he says, we should forever keep in mind that we must not brood on the wickedness of man, but realize that he is God's image bearer. Now, actually, that's how you manage issues about sexual temptation and the desire to take someone's head off and all of that, is you remember you're dealing with someone um, that is in God's image. He's God's image bearer, and that is, that is why he is worthy of your love. <laughs> Not because of what he does or doesn't do. Uh, so uh, cross-bearing then is a way of spelling out the self-denial, but cross-bearing is not a helpless hopeless grind that's designed to make you, you miserable. Your cross is designed to lift your burden and allow you to live happily in patience and love with the situation you're in. And so page 47 uh, takes that up. And the cross, 49, makes us humble. Now, can you put that together with our teaching? Humble is dependent upon God. The cross cuts off your self-dependence. And the cross makes us humble. And then, page 51, the cross makes us hopeful. Now, why? Well, because we have at last come to put our trust in what genuinely gives us reason to hope. If I'm hoping in my own kingdom, I don't have any reason to hope. That's death. The mind of the flesh that is trusting in myself and in the natural world uh, robs us of hope. Now, we, we did talk earlier about the difference between the cross and the crosses. You see, you have to take the cross, and then in the crosses, the little crosses, as he calls them, I don't like that language, I think it's very, very difficult uh, to come to terms with it. But still, if you take the cross, then under the difficulties of life, you will be cheerful. You will be cheerful. And uh, you will also cry. And that's okay, too. One of the lovely things in this, on the bottom of 59, is we are not required to be cheerful. It's okay to groan. It's okay to have tears. It's okay to be disappointed. And Calvin is very conscious of the Stoic and what we today would know as the Buddhist approach to these kinds of things which is just denial. Calvin, no, no. This is a world where we suffer. But we take the cross, and that liberates us from hopelessness, and still, as we go through the process, we hurt. And we don't try to deny that. Sing and smile and pray, for that's the only way. If you sing and smile and pray, you'll drive the clouds away. 
Well, there's some truth in that, but sometimes you don't feel like singing and smiling and praying. And Calvin is saying, don't fake it. Be real. Yes. We have to teach them that sorrow and rejoicing are not antithetical. So we go back and we hear old brother Paul saying, I am sorrowful but always rejoicing. Now, how can you do that? Well, you have to teach them what joy is. Joy is not whoopee. Um, Joy is, as I said, a pervasive sense of well-being. And that is compatible with pain and sorrow. So basically, we just have to make sure that they understand what these are. And it's really important that we do that. And one of the reasons why I spend so much time defining and describing is because we desperately need it. And we don't do enough of it. Yes. Um, I'm trying to reconcile what he's saying with the picture of meaning of life in the kingdom. And on page 47, he says, we need to prepare ourselves for a life that is hard, difficult, laborious, and full of countless griefs. Right. And then later he's talking about being weighed down by anxiety. Yep. And that just doesn't, I guess maybe I'm misunderstanding your picture of the kingdom, but it seems like you're saying it becomes this life of easy routine obedience. Mm hmm. You know, Well, I think I, all I can do there is ask you to sort of work on that and see if you can't come to an understanding of joy and lightness that is consistent with burdens. You're not promised no burdens, but you're promised strength to bear them. And the lightness is seen in how you take your responsibilities in relationship to them. And I, I'm going to try to get you all to offload the responsibility of outcomes and shift those to God. And when you do that, you begin to experience the lightness of the yoke. And again, that contrast that we read the very first day or looked at from 2 Corinthians 4, where he lists all those different things. On one side is the treasure, on the other side is the vessel. And uh, I, this is not a simple little thing. You, have, you will have to work through it to your own satisfaction. And uh, it will take a little while, but I'm hoping that the distinctions that I've drawn and the way you take those back to the scripture, you can begin to see it. And see, Calvin doesn't want us to fake it. And when we hurt, we hurt. But there is help and there is hope. And uh, uh, just quickly to wrap up here on page 67, the cross and self-denial and all of that brings us hopefulness of heaven. This is really important. And it is one of the things that in the mix of contemporary Christianity and life, we do not do justice to. There's an old hymn, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And you, you just want to make sure you don't mean, think that means only after you're dead. But it does mean that. And there really is no solution to the um, uh, difficulties of life than the hope of heaven. And if that's, if, see, if that doesn't mean anything to us, then it won't help us. And it, it's very interesting, and it's, it's fascinating to watch people handle the text of old writings. Look on page 67. And uh, now the phrase here, with whatever kind of trials we may be afflicted, we should always keep our eye on this goal that we accustom ourselves to the contempt and now our editor and translator wants to help us out. Because the old language, 
absolutely standard language was contempt of the present life. Contemptus mundi is a standard practice of the older church. Contempt for this world, contempt for this life. But he wants to help us out. And so he interpolates of the vanities of the present life. And the message is that in the light of the world to come, the present life is to be regarded with contempt. Now, contempt doesn't mean all in this language that it means. It means something more like indifference. Contempt, indifference. We have added on to that but if you get your Oxford English Dictionary and look, make a study of the word, you'll see that it means something more like indifference. And the indifference is not based upon the nature of this present life so much as it is the comparison with the life to come. And in the light of that, which we've entered into by the cross and so forth, then hopefulness for the next life is what lifts us out of all of the difficulties in this life. And so you get uh, language like on page 70, human life is nothing but a vapor or shadow. Uh, the things of earth grow strangely dim, right? So we've even sung that here in the light of what the full story is. So then go, he goes on to talk about not fearing death and winds up in the passage I've already referred to talking about the importance of vocation. That God has placed us in this world at a place, in a time, and that we are to stand there as his vicars. Now if you don't believe that you're a vicar, of Christ, you believe you need a backward collar on or something to be a vicar, please work on that. You are a vicar of Christ where you are. That's your calling. If you're working in a taco stand, you are a vicar of Christ. And he wants to teach you how to do that as he would do it if he were you. <laughs>